The horrific events of World War II would cause a wave of philosophers to come onto the scene. Amongst these thinkers trying to tackle a world that showed itself to be far worse than anyone had imagined was a man who shouldered the guilt of a past that wasn't his. His philosophy is bleak and tragic, but at the same time joyful and uplifting for those who take the time to listen. Reiner Schurman was born in Amsterdam on February 4, 1941, to German parents. His father is believed to have been a Nazi collaborator, making a small fortune selling weapons to Hitler's war machine. His father managed to escape punishment after the war and essentially moved on as if nothing had happened. This, combined with the general shame of being a German in post-World War II Europe, would haunt Schurman from a very young age. He would do anything he could to rid himself of this inherited sin. Too young to remember the war, too old to forget it. He became obsessed with the cultural wounds that still festered after the war and with the question of how we grapple with our origins, especially those we did not want to be a part of. In a desperate attempt to absolve himself of his inherited guilt, he moved to a kibbutz, a commune-like community in Israel. He is even rumored to have committed acts of repentance, such as flogging himself in the streets of the community. However, the stain of his German blood could not so easily be washed away, and he was forced to leave by the Jewish settlers. Following his attempt to physically rid himself of his origins, he tried doing so intellectually. Schurman joined Les Sauchois, a theological school of the Dominican order in France, and committed to writing in French instead of German. Here is where he would begin to explore the dark trenches of his guilt-ridden thought. His teachers did their best to steer him towards classical Catholic philosophers, such as Thomas Aquinas, but he found himself drawn to more radical thinkers like Jean-Paul Sartre, Karl Marx, and Baruch Spinoza. He began to explore the question of our origins more deeply and became captivated by Eckhart's conception of the Godhead. Meister Eckhart was a theologian from the early 14th century whose radical and controversial ideas of the divine had been largely banned by the Catholic Church, who considered it to be a form of mysticism. Eckhart's The Mystical Way would come to represent a tragic double bind that Schurman felt we were always being pulled apart by. On one hand, we cling to the security and comfort of our beliefs, and on the other, we always feel the undercurrent of death and meaninglessness behind it all. In this rendering, the Godhead, or nothingness, gives rise to the Trinity, which could be thought of as natural law. But notice that through the process of the recognizable and logical functions of life, the circle of the Godhead is present within us. This woke Sherman up to ideas that would ultimately get him sent away from his school in France, to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. This was not a post desired by European intellectuals of the time. Having been rejected once more, his old struggles resurfaced, but things were about to change. He was discovered by Hannah Arendt and brought to the new school in New York City, where he would finally get the chance to become the philosopher he was born to be. In his critical exploration of history and philosophy, Schurman discovered what he believed to be the source of the great evils human beings inflict on each other, and the painful experiences of exclusion and loneliness woven into the human condition, what he called hegemonic phantasms. These phantasms are the reigning thought that underpins every epoch. These phantasms are prior to speech and action, and are ultimately artificially created ideas that we establish as true. When we create these, such as the dawn of Christianity, these ideas help us cope with life. In essence, they are useful to us. But over time, they begin to fail in explaining our world. But people, desperate for the meaning these phantasms give them, often fight to preserve them, such as the brutal religious wars in late medieval Europe, as well as the Spanish Inquisition. We create these phantasms because we are too feeble to comprehend the grand design of the cosmos, so we make one. The death of God, as marked by Friedrich Nietzsche, is just one example of the collapse of a hegemonic phantasm. Schurman would end up picking up many of the questions posed in Nietzsche's works and leaning on the works of Heidegger as well. Humans deny the tragic loss of their old values. From fighting for old cultural traditions to fascist regimes, this happens over and over again. This is why, for Schurman, these phantasms are violent in nature. They necessarily exclude anyone who does not fit them the moment we adopt it. But because they are ultimately made up, we are always faced with the double bind shown by Eckhart, 
the feeling of meaninglessness always pulls on our grand ideas and designs. Schroeman does not think that our belief systems by themselves are evil, but he does think that the way we often react to them is. When we are faced with a decision, the tragedy of two principles in our lives coming into conflict, we must make a choice. This is the tragedy of our lives for him. The fact that we pretend that everything fits into this perfect system, but somehow these things come head to head and we must deny one in favor of another. In order to illustrate this, Schroeman calls upon an example from the Greeks. Displayed on a fresco in a Roman house in Pompeii and based on an original from 500 BCE, the tragic sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter. The great army and fleet, backed by Zeus himself, has gathered and prepares to set off for Troy. This mission represents everything deemed important to the Greek state in the era of Mycenaean hegemony. However, Artemis had plans of her own, causing adverse weather conditions to prevent the fleet from leaving. She demanded that Agamemnon sacrifice his daughter if he wanted safe passage across the Aegean. He found himself at the crossroads of two divine commands concerning laws which normally live in harmony with one another. The coexistence of the familial and the state law lives under the hegemonic phantasm, a design which they both have a place in. But tragedy always has its day. Agamemnon is fully aware of the terrible predicament he is in. He knows that either course will lead to misery. If he chooses to spare his daughter, he may well doom Greece to political and economic infighting and decay in the face of a failure to carry out their divine tasks. If he sacrifices his daughter, he commits an act of violence against his own kin and the future of his house, a most memorable transgression. However, it is not this moment nor the options available that Sherman really wants to draw our attention to. It is how we react to such inevitable situations. When Agamemnon makes the decision to carry out the sacrifice, he is not yet evil in Shurman's eyes. But the fact that he denies the tragic consequences of such an action is. Agamemnon comes to believe himself morally good for doing it. He becomes blind to the horror of the deed. He maximizes the law of the state and thus obliterates the family law. The violence of a law that excludes others is then born from the denial of the tragic situation not the decision to choose a course of action. This maximization has consequences that extend beyond Agamemnon himself. As head of state, he also maximizes this law for the city and justifies further actions along the same lines. This immediately subsumes those who follow and alienates those who have chosen any different set of actions or continue to dwell in the face of tragic knowledge. Just like the Nazi regime violently rejecting non-Aryans the moment they declared themselves good for being Aryan, every time we believe we are absolutely good in our course is a path to violence and hell. For Shuraman, every evil regime and oppressive ideology can be traced to this single behavior. When we run from the tragedy that is our life and try to justify it with some made-up system of morality, we commit evil. In short, if you must do something bad for a greater good, do it, but don't call yourself a hero. Sherman's life came to an equally tragic end at the young age of 52 from an AIDS infection. He believed that this era we are in right now, fresh off the heels of what he called terrestrial violence the likes of which we have never seen, is an opportunity to forge a new way. Instead of turning to some ideas like patriotism, capitalism, socialism, or any isms, we should try to break this violent cycle. Picking up on what Nietzsche tries to convey in The Gay Science, Schurman urges us to forego these phantasms and do our best to live a life that we know is tragic. To have beautiful things that we know will not last. To enter new eras and let old ones die. To be ourselves and live life for the sake of itself, not some grand purpose. Put simply, we must recognize that the universe is, as Nietzsche would say, to all eternity chaos and instead of running from it, find joy in living in it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel for more. It helps us immensely. Visit the link in the comments to see how you can become a member of our community and support the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.